Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's virtual ARLD keynote, Loving Libraries and Loving Yourself, presented by Fobazi Itar. I'm Amy Mars, Chair of ARLD, and I'm thrilled that you are able to, that we're able to come together uh, during these challenging times and listen to what is sure to be a timely and relevant talk that inspires critical reflection. Before we get started, a few things. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the chat to alert us and we'll do our best to help you resolve those. After a short word from our sponsors and the announcement of the 2020 Academic Innovator Award, our keynote will begin. We will leave some time for questions at the end and we ask that you use the Q&A feature for this. Please tweet using our hashtag ARLD20. And this talk is being recorded and will be available later on the MLA website. So um, I wanna express gratitude to the ARLD board whose hard work makes this and other events come to fruition. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment and introduce the board. Okay, so first of all, let's introduce past chair, Megan Coker. Hello. Chair-elect, Jenny McBurney. Hi. Legislative liaison, Jimmy Moran. Hello, everyone. Communications officer, Janice Shearer. Hi, everybody. Secretary, Kristen Cooper. Hi, everyone. And our members at large, Christina Beckles. Hi. And Becky Vrabel. I also want to thank our very generous sponsors. Um, it is because of them that we were able to offer this keynote at no cost. Um, and we're also going to give a couple of our sponsors a moment to um, to talk. So all right. Ooh. All right. Maggie Snow from Minitex has the floor first and I've unmuted her. So you should be able to talk, Maggie. All right, thank you. I'm Maggie Snow, the director of Minitex, and I'm pleased to be re representing Minitex at ARLD Day today. As you probably know, Minitex is a joint program of the Office of Higher Education and the University of Minnesota Libraries. For almost 50 years, we've collaborated with libraries to provide services for staff, patrons, and communities across Minnesota. And even in these times of uncertainty, we continue to provide resources and services, many of which are fully accessible online including eLibrary Minnesota, AskMin, eBooks Minnesota, and the Minnesota Digital Library. Our physical delivery network is temporarily suspended, but our resource sharing team and IT team modified MinLink to operate without the need for a library card authentication so that patrons can still access electronic resources despite library closures. I'm incredibly proud of the work our staff has done to keep services running smoothly. And Minitex is proud to be sponsoring this day today, this opportunity for library communities to come together and to explore ideas and perspectives. I had the opportunity to hear Fabazi speak last fall, and I'm sure you'll find her ideas and perspectives thought provoking. So thank you and have a great ARLD day. Uh -huh. Um, it looks like we're having a little trouble with our um, Elsevier sponsor not being able to get in. And we're working on that. So why don't we move on for now? Um, and we can come back after the Innovator Award if, if they are able to join us. All right, great. So um, let's see if we could go to the next slide, Amy. Um, so I'm Jenny McBurney. I'm going to present the uh, Minnesota Academic Innovators Award. Um, and so this is an annual award that recognizes academic librarians or academic project teams who have made an outstanding recent contribution to advance the mission of an academic library in Minnesota through an innovative project program or service. 
And so this year, ARLD is recognizing the outstanding work by Kelly Kramer, Adam Kazuski, Ethan Wittrock, and Sarah Geritz, the four-person learning sequences team at College of St. Benedict, St. John's University, Libraries, and their Instructional Technology Unit. These four developed a series of sequences documents that help guide collaborations between the two units and classroom instructors. When we were reading their nomination letter, we were really excited to learn about how they were integrating information literacy into different courses with these documents. And we believe that these are a valuable contribution to the academic library community in Minnesota and provide a model for other librarians to engage students with information literacy through technology. So we are excited to present this award to them today. Kelly and Adam are here today to accept the award on the group's behalf and spend a few minutes telling us more about their project. So let's see, Megan, are we able to get Kelly and Adam unmuted? Sorry, yes, I'm getting there. Thanks. Sorry, so many attendees. All right, there's uh -huh. Kelly. Hello. And I don't see Adam. Yeah, I'm not seeing Adam. Adam, if you are there and you could raise your hand or uh, chat what your name is to us, maybe we could find you. Yeah. If you raise your hand, you'll pop to the top and we'll be able to find you. Otherwise, I can talk for both of us if he isn't logged in yet. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to get him in shortly. Sorry about that. Sure, no problem. Um, do you control the slides or do I control the slides? Yep, just let us know and we should go to the next one. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so like Megan said and Jenny said, my name is Kelly Kramer, accepting this award on behalf of the team. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll just give a little background on learning sequences. So a shared goal of our libraries and instructional technology departments have worked on over the past few years has been uh, to better integrate digital literacy and information literacy into media related classroom projects at CSBSGU. Um, and initially when we started doing these sorts of projects, uh, we felt that sometimes they'd lack structure or sometimes they would prioritize learning a shiny new tool over considering meaningful student learning. So we now use these sequence documents in our planning meetings to provide structure, prompt discussion, and keep the focus on learning outcomes. So our sequence team was formed last summer in 2019, and our task was to take tool-based technology sequences that were originally developed by our instructional technology department and rework them to infuse the technology training with more information literacy. So we revised two sequences and then created three new ones uh, for each of the technology that we have used in classroom assignments. So those are video projects, podcasting or audio, 3D printing and design, web blogs and digital exhibits, and then data visualization. Uh, and you can follow the link on the slide there to find the documents on our instructional design website. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, each of the sequences on these documents included a multi-step visual representation of the process. So each of the steps in each of the bubbles is designed to maximize students' ability to think critically about the aspects of their work. Um, every sequence document also includes details on what's involved in each of these steps um, and includes things like best practices and recommendations for executing the projects. 
So each learning sequence also references learning outcomes derived from the ACRL framework for information literacy and makes it clear that the primary purpose of these projects is not to learn the technology itself, but to help students think critically and creatively about the topic they're researching and addressing. So the primary audience for these sequence documents is librarians, instructional technology staff, and class instructors. Next slide. Uh, the sequences were really a result of a very close partnership between libraries and the IT department. Um, rather than compartmentalizing ourselves, we recognized that each of us brought different strengths and perspectives to instructional design, and we created something that gets students excited and engaged with these projects. And we know that they're learning much more than a technology because the focus of those sequences goes beyond simply teaching a tool. Uh, final slide. Um, we're all very honored to receive this award. And uh, really knowing that other libraries and instructional designers can use our learning sequences to further teach critical thinking skills is the biggest compliment and accomplishment for us. So we're really grateful. And we welcome your questions, or if you'd like to engage us in further discussions, please don't hesitate to reach out and talk with any or all of us. Thank you so very much. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and congratulations to all of you. I'm sorry it doesn't look like uh, we were able to get Adam uh, able to speak here. But thank you so much for speaking. And uh, hopefully everyone saw that the link to um, that uh, tiny URL that was in the slides is now available in the chat. So you can go check that out. Yeah. And I see that our Elsevier rep has joined us. So Amy, if you can go back to the sponsor slide, um, I'm going to turn on Gwen microphone and Gwen um, will you will have a few words from you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here to represent Elsevier's sponsorship of the ARLD Day uh, uh, keynote address. I'm the very new VP of Global Library Relations at Elsevier and having just come from seven years as the executive director of Ohio Link the Ohio Consortium of Academic Libraries, I know firsthand the value of library organizations like Minitex and the Minnesota Library Association in connecting and supporting all types of libraries in their many endeavors. And this event today under extraordinary circumstances is a great example of that. Elsevier is especially pleased to sponsor this keynote topper, topic and speaker as we have a multi-pronged commitment to diversity and inclusion both externally facing and internally focused. And it has only deepened and accelerated under new CEO Kumsal Bayezid. I wanna mention just two initiatives. One is the extensive bibliometrically based report that Elsevier just published, The Researcher Journey Through a Gender Lens. And the report examines research participation, career progression and perceptions across 15 countries and the European Union in 26 subject areas. Some of the important findings in the report include men are more highly represented among authors with a long publication history, while women are highly represented under, among authors with a short publication history. Um, the average citation impact of men is higher than that of women, suggesting gender bias in citation practice, and women stop publishing earlier in their careers than men do, um, among many other patterns revealed by bibliometric data. Holly Falk Krasinski, who is one of the leads of the report, just did a fantastic internal presentation on the nuances and complexities of using bibliometric data responsibly and in a sensitive way when researching gender, including gender categories and the legal implications of GDPR privacy laws in the European, European Union. And I've talked to her and they're presenting a webinar later in the year just on the internal data analytics and the complexities of metadata in creating a report like this that I think would be very interesting to librarians. And all those URLs that I'm um, referencing, I've put into the chat window. Um, and I'd also like to bring your attention to the two paid 
diversity and inclusion student internships for which Elsevier is currently hiring. They are for a period of nine months and report to Amsterdam, although Elsevier works extensively virtually and did so before the pandemic. Um, so exact location requirements may be highly flexible. One of the interns will focus on disability inclusion, part of Elsevier's ongoing commitment to this area. And if you know of anyone who would be interested, please direct them to the application link. And then finally, I'd like to give my regrets and apologies for not staying for the entire event. I have to leave early for a very new normal reason. This is my designated grocery store shopping window that I had to schedule weeks ago and I dare not miss it. But I really look forward to catching up via the recording. Thank you again for the opportunity to say a few words and congratulations on going forward with this event. Thank you so much, Gwen. Um, thank you to all of our sponsors. And now we're going to um, get along with our keynote presentation, which you're all here to see. So I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. This is Megan Coker, um, past chair of ARLD. I first heard of Fobazi Itar during the ACRL 2019 conference where she was an invited speaker. I wasn't able to attend that session, but there was so much buzz about it on Twitter. I had to go find out more about who she was and this concept of vocational awe. Uh, I knew then that this was uh, someone I wanted to bring to Minnesota to share with the library community here. And I could not have known at the time that this would be such a uh, timely topic for us right now. And I'm so grateful that in spite of everything, we're able to uh, share this with you this morning. Fobazi Itar is the undergraduate success librarian at Rutgers Newark. Her identities as a first generation American queer and disabled woman of color shapes her librarianship, which is guided by um, critical perspectives and the deconstruction of white supremacy. Creator of the concept of vocational awe, Fobazi's research focuses on the tensions between the espoused values of librarianship and the realities present in the experiences of marginalized librarians and users. She also studies equity, diversity, and inclusion in libraries, specifically how social and organizational infrastructures privilege the work of certain groups over others. Fobazi is the author of the article, Vocational Awe, The Lies We Tell Ourselves, and the blog, WTF is a Radical Librarian Anyway which examines issues at the intersections of librarianship, education, activism, and social justice. Please join me in virtually welcoming our keynote speaker, Fobazi Itar. Hello everyone. Sorry, uh, let me just get my presentation going. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Yes. So, hello and happy Friday. I'll be looking off to my notes to the side. So if you see me not looking straight ahead, that's why. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. So um, thank you for that lovely introduction. As um, I said, my name is Fabani Itar and I'm the undergraduate success at Rutgers Newark. Uh, my job, as I define it, is to recast the narrative of the library on campus so that the students, staff, faculty, and wider community can understand the amazingness of the services that and uh, spaces that the library provides to the greater community. This is especially important on a campus like Rutgers Newark, where approximately 60% of the students are either first generation college students or otherwise non traditional students. Ironically, I used to describe my job as a virus where I would inject the library. Uh, amazingness onto campus 
and would define my success as the inability of anyone on campus to go without hearing how amazing the library is. Uh, of course, I've <laughs> changed my description of uh, my job since then. Um, but, you know, I do think it is ironic just how much the sort of act of contagion was used as a barometer of success before um, this happened. If you'd like to learn more about my work on identity, labor, and power, please feel free to follow my Twitter and or my blog. So before we begin, I'd like to um, point these two important points out. Locational awe underpins the whole narrative of librarianship. While the stories we tell about ourselves can define us, they can also confine us. And until we identify this narrative and how it plays out in libraries, we can't create counter narratives or even alternative narratives. And so that is what I aim to do today, to reveal the narrative of vocational awe within libraries and have us start to learn how we can dismantle it so that we as a field can begin to create new narratives. The work of identification and decolonization can and often does feel uncomfortable. It challenges our assumptions and exposes the blind spots that confine us. Sometimes it can even trigger defensiveness. I would ask that you embrace the discomfort, sit with it, learn through it, only by seeing clearly can we begin the important work of creating the plentitude of narratives that libraries deserve. Which leads me to my last point. Feelings are great, but actions are better. Right now, especially with COVID-19, we are feeling all of our feelings um, very loudly. I, I definitely encourage you to feel those feelings. They're absolutely absolutely valid. What I ask is that you don't let it stop there. Push through it and think about how you can start to make changes in yourself, in your workplace, in your organization. They don't have to be big changes. In fact, oftentimes it's the small changes that make the most impact. But action is what will move things forward, not feelings. So what does it mean to love what you do, which in this case is libraries? I'm sure we've all seen this quote you know, or a variant of it. Choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. The sentiment behind it basically boils down to the idea that love and passion can make anything even work feel like play. And because of this love and passion, uh, these ideal workers become successful precisely because they are doing what they love. To them, their job duties are the most perfect and pleasurable way to spend those hours between 9 and 5 p.m. or whatever your schedule might be. Scholar Mia Tokimitsu has written a lot about the do what you love narrative, and I definitely encourage you to check out their work. The problem with the do what you love narrative is not the actual loving of your job. I definitely encourage everyone to at least like their job, if only because it makes working slightly easier. The problem becomes when Loving your job, loving libraries, is the foundation of a job, of a career, of a profession. Doing what you love and in libraries it has become the concept of vocational awe, which has become the cornerstone and foundation of the field. So, vocational awe. Is librarianship an occupation or a vocation? While these 
words, occupation, and vocation are technically synonyms, there are very different connotations for the two. An occupation is the work in which a person is employed, whereas a vocation is a summons or a strong inclination towards a particular work or course of action. Usually a, define, a divine call to action or religious life. In many of its earliest uses, a vocation referred to the way one lived one life in response to God's call. So while you can have an occupation, a vocation is forever. Um, I'm a pastor's kid. Uh, shout out to any PKs in the audience. There's usually at least one. Um, and so as we PKs know, while you may leave church, church never really leaves you. There are Bible studies, religious retreats, even vacation Bible school during the summer. So again, I ask, is librarianship an occupation or a vocation? Unfortunately, as you can see from the response to COVID-19, librarianship is very much treated as a vocation. Even into the month of May, as we now are, there are still libraries that have never shut down. In many states, it took advocacy from the unions and from government entities in order to give libraries a legitimate reason to shut down. The idea that libraries are so vital to democracy and civilization that closing them down would close the soul or of the, our nation is unfortunately the driving force behind many libraries reluctance to close and to stop in-person services such as curbside pickup. At Houston Public Library, one of the workers were tested positive for COVID-19. And not only were their colleagues expected to still come into work physically into the building, but according to a spokesperson for HPL, Blanca Quezada stated that unless the employees use their sick slash vacation time, they must come in or expect to be laid off. In Chicago, the CPL commissioner, Andrea Telly, thanked their workers for their dedication during the crisis as they refused to shut down. It took Mayor Lightfoot issuing a statewide shelter in place in order for CPL to finally close. Over and over again, we see that love and passion were put over safety and wellness. Across the country, and indeed across the world, librarians were asked and are being asked to put their health and potentially their lives on the line in service to the mission of the libraries, serving the public. So what is vocational awe? Vocational awe describes the set of ideas, values, and assumptions librarians have about themselves and the profession that result in notions that libraries as institutions are inherently good and sacred and therefore beyond critique. So how does this break down? Libraries are inherently good. Well, they provide access to all, have diverse collections, champion truth and free speech. Unless of course, they're undesirable. Libraries have unfortunately had a long history of espousing to be open to everyone and welcome to everyone. But for example, libraries were segregated for a long time. And in many cases, libraries closed or shut down the branches rather than integrate or in a way 
that harkens to some of the steps taken now during COVID, libraries would remove all of the tables and chairs from the room that was integrated to prevent uh, mixing of the multiple races and encourage people to leave as quickly as possible. Libraries are often seen as inherently sacred. They are holy, otherworldly, awe-inspiring, a safe space, a sanctuary. However, again, libraries have never truly been a safe space for everyone. They've only been a sanctuary, a safe space for the privilege, those who we deem worthy. Libraries often create policy that either explicitly or implicitly shows who they think should have a safe space. With our meeting room policies saying that Nazis cannot be banned from the library, libraries show that it is not in fact a safe space for everyone because a safe space for Nazis is only safe for those who support the ideology and or are not affected by the ideology itself. Lastly, libraries are often seen as beyond critique because they're the last bastion of democracy or the soul of the community, as we saw with the Michael Crichton quote. But if libraries are beyond critique simply because it is a stand-in for the concept of democracy, then refusing to address its very real problems actually chip away at democracy itself. For instance, as I've talked about how libraries have upheld white supremacy and left out certain marginalized groups, even valid critiques about labor practices and the increased demands on the librarians themselves cannot be addressed if the goodness of the library is used to render these critiques invisible. In a true democracy, no institution is beyond reproach. And so, how does vocational awe get weaponized in the workplace? Well, libraries often work on a Taylorism model, except that instead of efficiency, passion and love are the metrics in which workers are evaluated. It starts with an energetic and passionate person who is hired into the organization. And then a passionate worker is used and abused uh, and I'll go more into what that abuse looks like later, until they inevitably burn out and leave. In which case, the cycle starts anew, where they either hire another energetic and passionate person to start the process all over again, or they don't hire another person and instead just shuffle the abuse onto the remaining people in the organization. So what does this abuse look like? It looks like a lack of work-life separation. I, I'm sure in the chat, um, many of the people who are seeing this slide can feel at least one of the things that have been on this slide, right? Working through lunch, working late, especially in this now fully online environment where the day, if you're not careful, can stretch between 10, 12, 14 hours, right? It is the idea of checking your email, at all, answering email at all hours of the night and weekends, and the feeling of guilt when taking sick or vacation days, days that were assigned to you as a worker. All this to say, 
is that we should not consider it a badge of honor to be so impassioned about our work that we put our whole person into our job. And not only does work-life separation hurt those who are able to do so, it literally creates a barrier for those whom, for whatever reason, cannot put their whole selves into a job, whether it is child rearing or child care, whether it's taking care of older relatives, whether it is being disabled, there are many reasons why you might not be able to work through lunch and dinner, take all the time of the day within libraries. And by using this passion as the metric, it marginalizes those who can't. Another way that the do what you love narrative and vocational awe impact workers and abuse workers is by job creep. As times have gone on, libraries have become the catch all for every failing social service. We've become social workers, EMTs, therapists, legal consultants, accountants, and now during COVID, we were asked to do even more duties as assigned as part of our day. In San Francisco, libraries were turned into daycare centers for children of emergency workers. Some are selling masks and staffing food banks. Across the country, libraries and library workers are being asked to do everything and anything as a stopgap for an essential and often understaffed social service. And of course, all of these other duties as assigned are given without institutional support or care, which then leads to burnout which is defined as a state of exhaustion in which one is cynical about the value of one's occupation and doubtful of one's capacity to perform. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, this quote was by, done by Christina Maslach, one of the original researchers of occupational burnout. Within libraries, Katrina Davis Kendrick has done a lot of amazing work on low morale experiences, which are brought on by the repeated and protracted exposure to workplace abuse and neglect. I would definitely check out her work for more information. But well, how does burnout apply? It implies because of the emotional labor libraries often entail, the invisible labor that we often take on, job creep and heavy workloads, and again, lack of institutional support for all of these things that we're doing. Basically, in the vocational awe and do what you love framework, labor is not something one does for compensation but as an act of self-love. And when passion becomes the socially accepted motivation and reason for working, talk of adequate wages and reasonable scheduling becomes crass and morally bankrupt. So what can we do? We can begin to love ourselves. Only by changing the paradigm from loving what you do at the cost of everything to loving work and loving yourself can you begin to move forward and have a healthier work-life balance. And so how do you begin to love yourself and what does it mean to do so? I always like to use this quote by Audre Lorde. Caring for myself is not a self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. 
and that is an act of political warfare. So the first and most important thing is to take this quote to heart. Caring for yourself is not self-indulgence. Loving yourself is not selfish. It is self-preservation. It is a political act. It is a radical act. And more importantly, it is important and essential for survival. Just like food, water, and shelter, self-care and self-love is something that cannot be dismissed or ignored. The Do What You Love framework and vocational awe hides the fact that if we acknowledge all of our work as work, we cannot set appropriate limits for it demanding fair compensation and humane work treatment. Don't let it. Understand that work is work and that your labor deserves support, care, and compensation. So, how do I start? Well, First thing, right, setting boundaries. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries are your friends. As important as those job duties might seem, they can wait. Unless the building is on fire or flooding or some other actual disaster is happening, uh, that email that was sent to you at 8 p.m. doesn't have to be answered right then. It doesn't have to be answered on the weekend. Set, setting goals for having a set work schedule or during this time of COVID where flexibility is important, making sure that you're taking time out for yourself is important to set those boundaries. Set aside time for your life. Set aside time for your loved ones, your hobbies, Whatever it might be, it's important to know that work, while important, is not the entirety of your life. And another way to do it is to work collectively. It can be hard to set boundaries and stick to something without help. Any new habit, right, takes at least 21 days to fully set in. And so whether or not you're in a unionized environment, act as a union with your workers. It's a lot harder for administration or management to come down on a body if it's united. Right, especially if, especially for something like setting boundaries. Uh, when one person is continuing to work 24 seven, it's a lot easier for management and administration to use passion and dedication as a bludgeon against you, right? Because they can say, oh, well, so-and-so they answer my emails even if I email them on Sunday at 2 a.m. Therefore, that makes it harder to set those boundaries that you might want. Especially now during COVID-19, where, again, the workday can stretch really long if you're not careful. Talking to your colleagues, talking to your coworkers, and coming to a collective decision to have more humane and manageable work hours is a powerful way to begin to love yourself and to have work-life separation. These are, again, things that aren't easy, aren't simple, and may not take a day to get started in terms of advocacy, but it's vital. And so as I 
start to end this uh, presentation, I'd like to, again, go back to the Audre Lorde quote and say, I, to take this quote to heart, caring for yourself is not self-indulgence. Caring for your family is not selfish. It's not a privilege even. It's a right that we as workers all should have. It is an act of political warfare, it's an act of radicalism. And so as you begin to set those boundaries and work collectively, make sure to remember to take time for the fun things in life. Um, as I said at an earlier panel this week, we're not working from home. We're currently at home during a crisis trying to work. Now more than ever, it's important to love yourself, reject the do what you love narrative and vocational awe and begin to have a healthy work-life separation. Thank you and I will take questions now. Thank you so much. Um, for the Q&A, there's a Q&A uh, special session at the bottom of your screens. If you see it, I don't know if you see it if you're in full screen, um, but feel free to put your, your questions into the Q&A and I'll, I will read those. Also, yes, much applause. <laughs> All right, now we've got some questions in here. So I will read our first question. How can we approach salary increases at this time? I meant to transition from a library assistant to librarian, but I'm nervous about asking for that raise given the situation. Yes, that is definitely a, a tough question. I would approach it the way that uh, I would approach a salary increase at any other time um, by looking at the job description, doing research if there are salaries, um, by other people at that level and what their salaries might be. If it's possible, asking your colleagues what their salaries are. I know it's always awkward talking about money, but transparency in this case is key in order to advocate for yourself. And this time, we can, during this time, we can say that, in fact, it's more important to have a salary increase to have that bump because times are so uncertain. And so doing the research, having pretty much everything that would appeal to an administrator or manager mindset which is, you know, or an HR mindset even. So the cost of living in the area, the, uh, again, sort of requisite salaries of people at that level. Um, if you can have actual data of other salaries, that's even better. And then creating a narrative of why, what, you will do in that position deserves the compensation that it requires. Um, like in, with anything where things aren't quite in your control, there's only so much you can do, but I definitely wouldn't 
feel guilty or feel bad about asking for a salary increase at this time. All right, our next question uh, from an anonymous attendee. How can lower level staff respond when upper management frequently demands growth mindset and positivity during this time? <sighs> growth mindset. Really. Um, so with positivity uh, or toxic positivity, as it were, right, the idea that positivity is more important than support, more important than advocacy or well-being. There, that is why I always try and say work collectively, right? It's a lot easier for upper management to come down on any one person uh, but if you as a group decide that you're going to do X amount of work and no more, um, it's a lot harder to punish everyone than it is to punish one or two people. And so if if the growth mindset is coming from a data standpoint, then sometimes data can be used as a way to advocate for yourself. Um, there are tons of data about how, about toxic positivity, about how a growth mindset is unsustainable. Um, is there upper management who is more about ideology than logic this can obviously be a lot harder in terms of advocacy um, so i would definitely say that working as a collective is probably your best bet in terms of making sure that management growth mindset um, doesn't lead into unsustainable work environments All right. Um, the next question from Tasha Nins. Any tips on gently telling the awful that are pressuring coworkers to stay super busy how to chill out right now? I find that oftentimes just asking them for clarification can do a lot. So if they are talking about like how they're working through lunch all the time or how they're working nights and weekends. Just a simple, oh, but why are you doing that? Can oftentimes sort of force them to take a step back. And as they start to try and rationalize and justify why they're staying super busy, it forces them to sort of look at the motives behind what they're doing. Oftentimes, those who are staying super busy are doing it as a stress response as well. Um, life is currently very out of control. And by staying super busy and making sure that they always have things to do, they are trying to impose order on a disordered world. And so even sometimes just, again, asking those clarifying questions, asking why, asking how, asking, um, or sharing your experiences can be a good way to sort of have them start to question their own motives and if it's actually important for them to be doing it as they're, as they're doing it. All right. The next question is from Becky Canavan. What thoughts or ideas do you have when it's not just the admin slash director, but that internal drive to serve students that's fueling the vocational awe? Yes. Oh, 
it's a lot, sometimes it's a lot harder to look within, right? Um, so when it's the internal drive, I try and for myself, because I do tend to also skew kind of um, workaholic -y when it comes to serving the students as well. You know, uh, just because I know it abstractly doesn't mean that there are times where my heart doesn't want to just put it all in. And so what I do is I remind myself that a healthy me actually serves the students better than one who is burnt out and stressed, right? Um, when you want to work through lunch, uh, reminding yourself that, you know, no one wants to see you when you're hangry, <laughs> you know? Um, when you're tired because you haven't gotten enough sleep because you've been working all night, right? That's not the best way to serve students when you let these other important things go and stretch yourself thin, you can't actually give the best of yourself to the student, right? And so there's a reason why in the airplanes, um, it's put the oxygen over your own face before you try and help someone else, right? Because the point is that only when you are at your healthiest, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that you can best help others. And so definitely trying to keep that in mind when I want to keep going and going. All right, next, um, we have a question from Tim Johnson who says, can you speak more about your experiences, your experiences as a PK and how that influences your work on voc vocational awe? asking as a fellow PK who has wrestled with this over a 38 year career. Uh, first of all, hello, other PK. Uh, I would like you know, seeing others and talking to others because it's definitely an experience that is very unique in many ways. I definitely think that my experience as a PK has influenced my work on vocational awe, I think that it was one of the reasons that I was perhaps maybe able to discern it as quickly as I did. Um, because again, when you're in the church, grow up in the church, everything, your whole framework is seen through a religious tint, right? Everything, every example, every decision you make is at some point influenced by sort of the calling of Christ. And so when I entered libraries, um, I was already used to sort of always filtering things through a religious um, or spiritual standpoint. And so it was interesting and a little perturbing to me to find that same sort of religiosity throughout um, library work. Uh, I, before I was an academic librarian, I was a school librarian. And I remember I went to a joint panel um, it was an a AASL YALSA panel. And one of the librarians said that serving the, their students, serving teens was a sacred duty. And I, that definitely took me aback because to actually state out loud that it's a sacred, to use the word sacred uh, and duty, it really just seemed like I was almost back in church with the message being go forth and do good work because this is something that is above any one person. And so 
as libraries supposedly are a secular profession, this was uh, very uh, triggering almost for me to have to encounter this sort of rhetoric and language in my professional life as well. And so in terms of wrestling with it, I think at this point, it's almost like going through the five stages of grief. <laughs> and, uh, and I've gone to the point where I sort of accepted that this is the framework that I'll see most things in. I think it's helped me in the creation of vocational awe. I think that um, some of the more, especially American Christian, threads that go throughout vocational awe and librarianship are more easily seen for me having that background than perhaps someone who didn't grow up in the church. Uh, growing up in the church can obviously be very complicated and I would definitely love to talk to you more about it. Um, feel free to uh, either hit me up on Twitter or my blog or email me and kabazi.etar at rutgers.edu and we can talk more about this. All right, our next question. Uh, what do you think about library folks in higher pay grades taking voluntary unpaid days during the current slash upcoming financial crisis? That is a complicated question with a complicated answer. So, on the one hand, you know, that is amazing if someone wants to give up some of their salary in order to help with the library and the administration during the crisis. The only, the real biggest reserve I have, and again, perhaps this was coming from a school library standpoint, is that I was always told, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so the, it sets a dangerous precedent for, library workers in the higher pay grades to do that because we don't know the stories of everyone in the higher pay grades, right? Um, just because they're making more money doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't disadvantaged in some way, right? They might be taking care of family, they might have a disability. Um, and so not all library administrators and managers and those in higher pay grades can do that. But by setting the precedent that some will, uh, it basically sets the expectation that you will do it. And so to me, it's just, it's a really slippery slope of, well, if you're willing to take unpaid days, maybe we don't have to give you paid days at all, right? Because you, we know that you'll continue working even if you don't get paid. So basically, long, long story short, it's good if you really want to, but I would think very hard about what precedent you're setting for those that's coming in the future. All right, our next question from Stacy. 
Vocational awe seems very ingrained in the work of libraries. Do you have any recommendations for starting the conversation regarding boundaries and collective work? In terms of research, uh, there are a ton of critical librarians who are doing research. I've mentioned uh, Katrina, um, who's doing work on low morale and workplace abuse. I definitely think like her work is a good place to start in terms of seeing the effects of not having any boundaries. Um, there's also work on uh, there's Twana has done a lot of interesting work on boundaries and the precarity of library work. Um, Anastasia Chu has talked a lot about residency, library residency specifically, in terms of the precarity of the work and how how organizations oftentimes exploit the ambiguity of the residency within the library organization. Um, in terms of more practical approaches. I think that just thinking about your job duties, like what does your, what does the actual document and job say and how much of that work are you doing versus other duties as a sign? That can be a way to sort of figure out um, what boundaries what the boundaries of your own work are, and if you've actually been following said boundaries. And then just talking to your colleagues, um, it can be as simple as a brown bag just saying, hey, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about work life and work life balance. How are you guys? And gals and non-binary pals um, approaching work-life separation, right? Are you approaching it? How can we sort of work together to set boundaries for ourselves? I always mention um, my friend and professional colleague, Charlotte Rowe, who put in her email signature does not respond on nights and weekends. I think that right there is a small step in terms of setting boundaries, right? You're saying, I'm only going to check my email and answer my email from this time to this time. Um, and whatever it is can wait until the next day or until Monday morning, whatever it might be. Um, definitely looking at the ways that organizations have unionized, so the way like grad students have unionized, the way that faculty have unionized in right to work states can be another way to figure out how to create those boundaries. All right, I think. We aren't going to have time uh, to get through all of the questions uh, that are remaining. There are quite a few still in here, so I think we'll take about two, two or three more. Um, so I'm going to ask this question from Kent. As we approach times with budgets likely to contract, there is more pressure to communicate how libraries are essential to people like the provost. How do you see us fighting against vocational awe and caring for ourselves and one another while communicating our value and feeding the narrative about how we are important to our institutions and society, like the quote from Michael Crichton. Thank you so much for your work and insights. Yes. <clears throat> yes, during this, during COVID, there's definitely a lot of pressure from 
outside stakeholders to prove our value. Uh, I think that when you're talking to outside stakeholders, knowing what angle best works for them is a good way to start. So if you know that, you know, the chancellor or the provost are very data driven, then making sure that you have data about how libraries play a huge role in academic success during, in terms of the digital divide, in terms of online learning. If you know that more qualitative and narrative approaches work best, then it is making sure to craft a narrative um, using stories from students, faculty, staff, whomever would best have the holistic narrative and bringing that to the provost or to the chancellor. When it comes from fighting vocational off specifically, I would also say to remember to pick your battle somewhat, right? Um, having the provost understand that libraries aren't inherently good and sacred might not be the best move, um, but that's not to say you don't want to dismantle vocational awe. The most important thing for the provost and chancellor to know is that despite the fact that we love our jobs and that we can do more with less, we shouldn't have to do more with less. Our work is valuable. Our work is worthy of compensation and support. And so again, whether it's through data or whether it's through quali more qualitative methods like interview information, um, focus groups, whatever you need to do, making sure that the value is crafted and shown in the way that emphasizes the importance of library work. All right, uh, another question. Do you have any advice for someone already at the point of burnout? So my question, my answer depends on two things. One, do you have vacation time to take? Um, if you do, take as much of it as you can right now. Literally step away from libraries. Do, obviously during COVID, there's a lot fewer options in terms of like, going places for vacation, but I think taking the time to reorient yourself to what you like and what who you are as a person outside of libraries is the most important thing you can do right now. If you don't have um, vacation days or personal days, then I would reach out to your community, whether it's a personal support system, whether it's a professional one, start talking about your feelings to other people who can understand what you're going through. Uh, oftentimes, burnout is very isolating, right? You, the bitterness, can feel almost too much to want to share and therefore you don't share at all. And that's the exact opposite of what you need to do. You need to start lightening the 
emotional and mental load on your body. And you, however you need to do that, whether it's, again, talking to a friend, a therapist, a professional colleague outside the organization, begin to share what you're feeling. Because that way, maybe those people have concrete ways that you in your specific situation can do to help alleviate some of that burnout. So those, whichever situation you're in, those are, that's my advice. All right, and I think for our last question, you've been answering questions a while now, so we'll make this the last one. Uh, Richmond asks, how can ALA, state associations, and state libraries support and advocate for frontline workers? Yes. Um, so I think that ALA took too long before they finally gave a statement supporting library closures. I understand that as a national body, there are a lot more politics than any one person or organization. However, if the goal is to support libraries and library workers, which unfortunately oftentimes are not treated as the same thing or they're conflated in the wrong way, right? Where we're saying, oh, we're supporting libraries, but they're not supporting library workers. Um, you know, I think that I personally stopped working on March 13th and ALA still hadn't released anything by then. You just, I think that if you're in a position of power, you have to be willing to actually use the power you are given, especially by those who are a part of your organization. If otherwise, what is the point of having this, having this governing body, having this support body, right? And so my advice for ALA and other sort of associations in state libraries is to one, listen to the library workers and understand what are the, what are the needs of your specific communities, right? The needs of New Jersey where I am will be very different than the needs of Florida or the needs of Oregon, right? And so making sure that you're actually advocating for the workers. Right now, curbside pickup is a big thing. And I don't agree that we should be doing curbside pickup. I think that we are taking PPE away from actual frontline workers such as nurses and doctors and hospital workers. And so supporting the library workers in, right now everything's about safety and wellness, right? The decisions that we're currently making will show the workers whether or not we actually care about their health, right? We know that vocational awe exists, and that the do more with less, do what you love framework is rampant. And so library workers are often going to want to do as much as they can to support their patrons. But again, the best way they can support their patrons is by being alive and healthy to do so. And so anything that can be done to make sure that the library workers stay alive and healthy to continue to serve their communities is most important, right? I mean, this should be not just during COVID, but especially now, the 
safety and wellness of our workers are the most important things. Not just so that we can continue to produce, of course, but in terms of just taking care of each other as a collective, right? We care about our communities. We are a part of our communities. And so we want to make sure that we're all taking care of each other. So that would be my advice in terms of advocating. All right, thank you so much. I wanna say there are in the Q&A and in the chat, there are so many thank yous coming in. Um, someone especially said, you know, thanks for being willing and able to take so many uh, difficult questions on the fly. Um, so we really appreciate that. And I know that this was um, a really important message for a lot of people to hear this morning during this time. So we are very grateful for this. Um, and that, with that, we're going to wrap it up today. Um, a reminder, if you have any questions about this, um, you can contact anyone on the ARLD board. The recording of this session will be posted on our website in a few days, so you can um, rewatch it there or send it to your, your colleagues, to your administration, to whomever you would like. Um, and yeah, we are so grateful that we were able to have this part of ARLD Day, and I hope that um, I hope we see you all next year at the Arboretum, uh, and that you um, and possibly this fall at the MLA conference. So, um, if you are planning to attend that in Duluth in October, um, we will see you there, uh, and consider submitting sessions, um, consider joining MLA or ARLD if you haven't already. Um, this is a really great board to work with. We get to bring programming like this um, and have some of that leadership say. So if you are in the position where you're looking for something like that, um, we'll be having board elections this summer. Anything else anyone from the board wants to chip in? Um, I just wanted to, uh, again, express so much thanks to Fobazi. Um, this talk's been incredibly uh, validating while at the same time really giving me energy to critique librarianship and the settings I work in, um, and also to, to cultivate solidarity among library workers. And I really can't think of a better way to spend uh, International Workers' Day, <laughs> which it also happens to be today. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and I would just like to say one last thing. I know that we weren't able to get to all the questions. Um, please feel free to either ask me those questions on Twitter and I will answer there. Or if you don't have a Twitter, um, send me an email and I will you know, get to them as I can. Um, I know that it can be not great to not have your question answered. Um, and so, yes, definitely, again, feel free to reach out to me, uh, fabazi.etar at records.edu, or just Google. The nice thing about your name being Fabazi Etar is that it's very hard to mistake you for anyone else. So if you find an email that has the Bosley ETAR in it, it will most likely get to me. Um, so yes, definitely feel free to reach out. All right, I'm gonna turn it off. Thank you everyone.